A uh, question on the Eucharist. If a Catholic is given communion with a non-consecrated host, but is not aware that it is not consecrated, is the act of con communion valid? No, of course not, because you don't have the valid Eucharist. So certainly, if it's a non-consecrated host, certainly it's not the Eucharist, and it wouldn't be a valid sacrament. Is it valid when communion is given to non-believers? Well, the Eucharist itself, if it's validly consecrated, if you have the form and matter of the sacrament, it's a valid sacrament. So the Eucharist is the Eucharist. If the Eucharist is valid, it's valid, regardless of who it's given to. Now, it's another question of, of, of is that licit to do that? Norm, normally it isn't. There are certain very specific conditions which the church has laid down. First of all, the bishop has to give a specific permission for that, number one. Number two, that person has to ha spontaneously ask for the sacrament. Number three, that person has to believe what the Catholic Church believes. Not that it's only a sign or symbol, but that it's in fact Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And last, have the required dispositions, be in a state of grace, approach it with, with reverence. But those are very specific conditions, and only the bishop can grant that. Nobody else can grant that. The bishop makes that decision. At a certain place, don't get me in trouble by, by <laughs> putting names here, uh, but I, I won't, I would never mention it. But at a certain place, they give communion to everyone. Uh, sometimes uh, these people aren't Catholic. Sometimes these people aren't even baptized. Sometimes these people don't even have any religion. Well, obviously, that's not the intention of the church. We don't want to do that. We don't want to profane that which is holy. What about in a, you're, you're someplace and you have a mixed group? There are Catholics there. There are other Christian denominations. There are some Jewish people, maybe people that don't practice any religion, and it's time for communion. What do you do? Well, you have to make an announcement. You know, you do not encourage everyone to come to the Eucharist. That is not the mind of the church. And I don't care who does it. That's not the mind of the church. You do not approach the Eucharist unless you have the capacity to approach the Eucharist, and that means you're a Catholic, you're in a state of grace. Or if you're a Christian who's not a Catholic, the bishop has given specific permission for that person. That person spontaneously requests the Eucharist. That person is in a state of grace. That person believes what we in the Catholic Church believe about the Eucharist. And on, there's no exception other than that. Oh, here's one, bound to get me in trouble. Uh, gee, if I was prudent, I probably wouldn't even deal with these, but, you know, people ask questions, and they have a right to answers, really. So I'm very much averse not to answering hard questions. I like to answer them, not because I like to answer them, but because you deserve an answer to your questions. Uh, a certain priest is a member of Call to Action, uh, of whom the good Bishop of Lincoln, Nebraska, said, among other groups, that they are excommunicated. Time is running out. They're already under interdict if they haven't gotten out of those groups. Planned Parenthood is one of them, Call to Action, and so forth. Now, if this priest were to move to Lincoln, Nebraska, does he become excommunicated if he stays in that, in that group? Absolutely. Excommunicated, no question about it. Does the bishop have the ability to do that? You bet he does. You bet he does. He, he can do it and he did do it, even though they're debating it and will continue to debate it. In that diocese, that bishop has made a stand. He has said enough. We have to clarify things. There's too much confusion. <laughs> a 
recently at a meeting um, of a group of religious superiors, a very large meeting, Bishop Bruskowitz was a speaker there. He received a 10-minute standing ovation, 10 full minutes standing ovation from uh, over a thousand people. Uh, some people think that what he did was not a good thing to do. Well, you know, I, I don't like to second-guess bishops. Uh, bishops have a grace that I certainly don't have, uh, any bishop, and so I don't like to second-guess them. But I'll tell you this, if you pur purport to be Catholic and you say that it's okay for a woman to choose to have an abortion, you don't believe what the Catholic Church believes. You have actually excommunicated yourself in virtue of the act itself. If you hold the position, even today, after all the clarification, that a woman can be ordained a ministerial priest, you are, you've fallen into a trap that is a post-baptismal, obstinate denial of a truth of Catholic faith which must be accepted with divine and Catholic faith. That's heresy by definition, and canon law calls for immediate, latte sententiae excommunication. And so the people who do that cut themselves off. The church doesn't do that to them. They do it to themselves. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that at all. It's not a good thing to do, to cut yourself off from the church. If someone receives a sacrament and they are not in a state of grace, will the effect of the sacrament work, la work later after the person has confessed? Depends what the sacrament is. Okay? Now, confirmation, matrimony, holy orders, uh, several of the sacraments. If you're not in a state of grace, you still receive the sacrament, but it's not efficacious. The grace of the sacrament doesn't operate. So later you go to confession. That sacrament is resuscitated. It's brought to life, and then it begins to operate in you. So if, if you're uh, one of the questions said, when I was married, the, the priest brought us right to confession before we were married. He said we had to go to confession, and today um, I don't see that anymore. Well, it's, it's certainly necessary, of course. You have to receive the sacraments in a state of grace. You may receive the sacrament, but the grace of the sacrament won't operate in you. No grace of a sacrament operates in you if you're dead, except penance or anointing of the sick. They're called sacraments of the living, many of them. The Eucharist is a sacrament of the living. If you had a dead body, a cadaver, and you gave them a nice T-bone steak, would that body profit from the food? No. Well, dead souls don't profit from the food of the Eucharist. They have to be living. Eucharist is a sacrament of the living, the sacrament of confirmation. You can receive the sacrament, but it doesn't work, it doesn't operate in grace. You don't receive the fruits of the sacrament until you're in a state of grace. But yes, go to confession, it's resuscitated. And so then you receive the grace. Not with the Eucharist, though. Okay? You receive the Eucharist in mortal sin. And later you go to confession. What about that, Conf that Eucharist before? No. No, that was a sacrilegious communion. And you don't receive grace from that. Okay. Um, I often see people coming to church late on Sundays and Holy Days. Sometimes they, they come only in time to receive communion. At what point during the Mass has one totally missed the Mass and is required to go again? Well, going from the Church's teaching that the Eucharist is an, an, an integral celebration, the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist constitute one single act of worship. You better get there for the Liturgy of the Word. That's an essential part of the Eucharist. The Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist constitute one single act of worship. So my advice on it is get there, it, you know, before the readings start, certainly. Try to get there before that. 
but at least by the time the readings start, because if you miss the liturgy of the word, or most of it, then you've missed that which is an essential part of that single act of, of worship. If the consecration is read nonstop from be beginning to end with no genuflection or bowing or elevation, is this a valid consecration? Well, it could be. If the form and the matter are correct, if you have wheat bread and wine and the priest has the intention to do what the church does and if he uses the words of institution, the proper words of consecration, you have a valid consecration. Now, whether he genu now you're supposed to do what the church does, but it's valid. It's valid. Whether he genuflects or not, uh, whether he uh, elevates the host or not, it's still a valid consecration. Now, some of those things, leaving them out, makes it illicit, but not invalid. You know, you still have a valid um, celebration of the Eucharist. Uh, we should do what the church tells us to do, but um, it's not that easy, really, to invalidate the Mass. There aren't too many invalid Masses, really, uh, thanks be to God. But there could be. You know, it's possible. I gave you the conditions. If a priest does not believe in transubstantiation, can he truly confect the Eucharist validly? Does he have the necessary intention? What does the communicant receive? Well, the words are, the basic norm is, you have to intend to do what the church does. You have to intend to confect the Eucharist. Okay, you have to intend to celebrate the Eucharist. And that's all the church says about it. Now, where the line is, is it's just hard to say. A lot of people believe or don't believe a lot of things, but if the basic intention to celebrate Mass is there, I would have to say it's a valid Mass. Uh, and I know these are hard, difficult situations we run into, but you want to always, always give the benefit of the doubt. Always give the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, sometimes poor priests get put in a terrible position. They get badgered and beaten on, and they're really not so bad as you might think. Now, sometimes, sometimes we may be misinformed or have funny ideas, but try to give the benefit of the doubt. And by all means, if you run into this, please, please, uh, pray. Pray and offer sacrifice. Uh, you don't know what priests go through, they're a target. The devil would rather destroy a priest than anybody else, and so he levels his most virulent poison, his, his worst darts are leveled at a priest. Why? Because strike the shepherd, scatter the sheep. You know, that, that's a, a very definite axiom the enemy uses. That, that, that's a tactical warfare, right? If you can subvert the faith of a priest, you can really cause confusion in the ranks. So we need to pray very much for our priests. It's not easy to be a priest. They under we, we, Terrible uh, things, uh, persecutions in a spiritual way befall many, many a priest. And always think this way, uh, except for the grace of God, there go I. I could be a thousand times worse than someone that we think has lost the faith or something. Everything's grace. And so be very charitable, be very kind, be very understanding, but also, you know, be solid. Be solid in your faith. Uh, should we receive Holy Communion if it is a prayer service and not Mass? Well, if I, sometimes in some places, they don't have a priest every day, and so a religious or a Eucharistic minister will celebrate a prayer service, a paraliturgical service, and I certainly would re the Lord is the Lord. Now, the ideal is to receive the Eucharist at the Holy Mass, certainly. I would want to do that. But if it's not possible, it's still the Eucharist, you know, and, and so I would receive the Lord at a prayer service or a, a paraliturgical um, service, certainly. I wouldn't want to do that every day and not have Mass, though. You know, the grace of the Mass is, is something very special. Now, we still receive the grace of Holy Communion when we receive the Eucharist, when we're in the hospital, or at a prayer service. So I wouldn't hesitate. 
Okay, you mentioned that the liturgy of the Mass must be said according to the teachings or rubrics of the Church. Is it okay for priests to personalize the Mass? Well, there, some of that can be done. You know, the priest has some leeway. Now, the problem is you want to be very careful. You know, this don't discredit yourself and your, you know, orthodoxy in the faith by jumping to conclusions. Um, it's, it's easy, a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. And, well, Father might have not um, washed his hands, you know, the lavabo. He might not have done that. Well, we, sh we should do what's prescribed. No getting around it. We should. But don't be quick to call him a heretic or say that it's an invalid mass or something, because it's not. Not heresy. It's not an invalid mass. You know, um, sometimes Father has a reason for this or that, and so don't be too quick to pound on him or to confront him. If you have to bring these things up, and sometimes we do in charity, but you better pray a lot before you do it. You pray and, and, and do some fasting or something because you don't want to be mean and you don't want to be uncharitable and you don't want to be impatient. You know, if the Holy Spirit honestly moves you to say a kind word to your priest, do it like, definitely as a kind word with all patience you know, preserve the peace, but sometimes we do have to give a word to the wise. And, and even we priests, you know, I've had people straighten me out. You know, it rubs us all the wrong way, I know. Uh, and sometimes, I'll tell you an occupational hazard of being a priest. An occupational hazard of the priesthood is, generally the people of God are very good to us. They are very kind to us, very respectful. They hold us in esteem. And that's good, but it can go to your head. And pretty soon, you begin to believe all those nice things that everybody says about you. And then when somebody points out something that's true, that you should have sufficient humility to accept, you don't. You blow up like a hand grenade going off, right? Push the wrong button, look out. Well, it's kind of an occupational hazard. And we priests have to constantly pray for humility. So if... If you need to speak a word to your priest, do it with great respect, do it with great charity, and you'll have a much better chance of getting your point across that way, too. For those who are already confirmed but did not realize the true meaning of the sacrament at that time, do those gifts from the Holy Spirit still reside in that person? Well, like I said before, you receive the sacrament, but if you weren't properly disposed, uh, let's say you're in a state of grace at least, but you don't, you're not particularly intense in your spiritual life. You're not very open to the spiritual life. So the grace of the sacrament operates at some level. You receive some of that grace. Yes, those gifts operate at a low level. But as you increase your, the intensity of your faith, you enter more deeply into prayer, you become more faithful in your sacrifice, your worship, your acts of virtue, the gifts of the Holy Spirit increase in you. Remember, according to your disposition. And so, yes, you have the gift. As long as it was a valid sacrament, you receive the sacrament, you're in a state of grace, the gifts operate. But they might operate at a very low level. They admit of a tremendous uh, number of degrees. And it's like the saints, you know. Uh, you can take someone who's barely, you know, they're in a state of grace, but does the, the Holy Spirit operate the same way it would in in Mother Teresa or St. Francis of Assisi? Oh, no, there's a tremendous variation. Common sense tells us that. Uh, what about the Christian denominations who do not baptize or who do not follow proper baptismal form? Quakers, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. Well, if you do not have valid baptism, you're not a Christian denomination, for one thing, because to be a Christian denomination, you have to have valid baptism. And valid baptism consists of immersion or pouring with water while saying the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, if they do that, they intend to baptize and they do that, it's a valid baptism. But if they don't pour the water or immerse in water, they have no water, and they don't use that formula, then there's no valid baptism and it's not Christian. It's not a Christian denomination. Even if they say they're a Christian denomination, 
You need valid baptism to be a Christian denomination. Uh, regarding what you said earlier, that baptism and matrimony doesn't necessarily need a priest, who else can validly officiate the sacrament of matrimony aside from the priest? Well, okay, the ministers of the sacrament of matrimony are the spouses. The sacrament is ministered by the spouse, one to the other. Each, you know, it's a mutual ministering. The priest or the deacon witnesses, witnesses the celebration of the sacrament. That's why in mission countries like in the Philippines, where my order is very uh, active in the Philippines and some of the out islands of the Philippines, um, you, you can't get a priest there or you can't get a, a deacon there. Those are the, the ordinary ministers of baptism um, or, or, in, or matrimony too. Priest, deacon, bishop. You have no priest, you have no deacon. Well, they, the bishop can uh, give the faculties to do that to a lay person, a religious sister. And what do they do? They witness the sacrament for the church. Now for a Catholic, that's necessary for validity, right? We need to have the form, valid form. And that's what a defective form annulment is. A Catholic who gets married without the proper form of the sacrament, meaning that you have to have that, that marriage witnessed by the church, by priest, deacon, someone that the priest, the pastor, or the bishop has, has um, given the faculties to witness, that then it's invalid because of form. Okay, so... Uh, the priest and the deacon or the bishop witnesses matrimony. They don't minister the sacrament. Matrimony is the one sacrament where the two people minister to each other. Husband to wife, wife to husband. The church witnesses that. Is com communion at a Greek Orthodox, Byzantine, and Russian Orthodox valid for a Latin Rite Roman Catholic? Okay, we've got to separate these. Let's put them in two categories. Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. Uh, they have valid sacraments. Byzantine, right, of course, has valid sacraments. They all have valid sacraments because they have a valid priesthood, because they have right of succession, apostolic succession through the sacrament of holy orders. Uh, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox are not uniate. They're not in union. The Eastern Schism that took place nine centuries ago or so, um, they, they don't accept the primacy of Peter, the Pope, all right? So they're separated from us, but they have valid sacraments, and they're very close to us, and we're working through dialogue to uh, enter into union. Um, the Byzantine rite is a different category. That's a uniate rite. Byzantines are Catholic. You know, Byzantine, Maronite, uh, Coptic rite, these are all uniate, meaning in union with the Pope. And so they're Catholic. So certainly you can go to those uh, rites anytime. You can go to a Byzantine rite mass, and you know, it's per perfectly fine for you. Uh, in, in a danger of not being able to receive the sacraments over an extended period of time, uh, you could get permission to go to a Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox church. They have valid sacraments. Uh, we should try to go to a uniate church, you know, assuming there is one. But let's say you live in the outskirts of Mongolia, and the only thing there is a Russian Orthodox Church, and you just can't receive the sacraments any other way. Would it be valid sacraments for you? Oh, yeah, sure, they have valid sacraments. Would you be receiving Jesus in the Eucharist? Yes, yes, absolutely. And so the Orthodox in all those Eastern rites, perfectly valid sacraments. How do we combat the charge that the receiving of Holy Communion is cannibalism? Well, that goes way back. That goes right back to the Lord's own time. That's what they really thought then. Who, who can accept this? You know, if it's his own body and his own blood, uh, that's cannibalism. Who, who can abide by that? And they went away. And so how do we answer that? Well, the answer is that although it is in fact the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. It's a sacramental presence. It is his presence. It is real, but it's a spiritual sacramental presence. In the end, it's a mystery. And if you try to figure it out and use your puny little brain too much, you'll hurt yourself. 
the fact of the matter is we can't figure it out perfectly. Why? Because it's a transcendent truth. If you were to understand everything that God teaches through his church, you would have to have the mind of God. Now, how could I understand everything about God and the things of God unless I had the mind of God? And I don't. Therefore, I grope. I do the best I can, but I fall short. And so I accept what the church teaches. I understand it as best I can. And then I abandon myself to God's love. I, I trust. I trust that God gave us his church to lead us and to instruct us in the truth. I received communion at my father-in-law's funeral service. It was a Methodist church. I was uncertain if I should receive or not. I asked God to forgive me if I did wrong because I really didn't know. Okay, well, that's, that happens. You know, that, that can happen to us, and, and we can become confused. But the, the general norm is we don't receive communion in other denominations. In the first place, uh, it's a sign. Uh, you know, they celebrate the Lord's Supper. They reverence it. They have the signs of bread and wine, sometimes grape juice. And as a sign, it's fine. You know, that, that's what they have, and we have to respect what everybody believes, but it's not what we believe. And so we can't partake in that communion because that's not our understanding of communion. So, so out of respect, when sometimes I go, uh, I've, I've preached in Baptist churches. I, I preached in the South at an AME Zion Baptist church one time, and, and it was great, but I, I didn't partake in in communion, and not to be disrespectful, to be respectful, to be respectful. Just like some of my Protestant friends, when they come to the Catholic Church, and even some ministers, they're respectful. They're very respectful of our faith. They're not offended. They're respectful of our, of our faith and what we believe. And so they don't attempt to partake of the Eucharist, because that would be like uh, a statement, that I believe what you believe. And they say, well, I can't say that, Father. I, I don't believe what you believe. I respect what you believe. But I don't believe what you believe. So that they respect us, and we have to respect them in the same way. Please mention the indult mass celebrated in Latin and encouraged by the Holy Father. People may get the impression that we are schismatics. No. The Holy Father has given permission. He's given an indult, an exception, for the celebration of the Mass, not only in Latin, but the Tridentine Rite. It's, you don't, you're not a schismatic if you are celebrating that with the proper permission. Now, the Latin Mass is very beautiful. Don't get the wrong idea from what I said before. Uh, I made a statement that for, for me and for many, being able to pray the Mass in our own language can be very helpful. Now, some have said, but I find the Latin Mass more helpful because it's so much more reverent. You know, the sense of the sacred seems to be so much more alive. I know what you're talking about. I, 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 I don't disagree with that. It's not a question of the language in that case. It's a question of how the Mass is celebrated. Now, if you had a so-called Novus Ordo, and it's not really a, a new order, but if you had a Novus Ordo celebrated in Latin or in English or in any other language, and if it would be done correctly, with great reverence, care with what you're doing, that can bring you into a deep sense of prayer, too. And so it's not so much the language as the way the Mass is celebrated. So if, you, if it helps you to uh, assist at a Mass celebrated in Latin, fine. There's, there's nothing wrong. You have permission to do that. That's perfectly okay. Uh, you know, there's permission at a couple places in this diocese that I know of for that. Vatican II didn't do away with Latin. Let's clarify the whole thing. Uh, it did not. It reiterated that Latin is the official language of the liturgy of the Western Rite, the Latin Rite, the Roman Rite. Latin is the normative language of the Roman Rite. An exception was granted to be able to celebrate Mass in the vernacular. And I'm just saying that that exception turns out to be, in a way, a blessing. If it were done the way it should be done, it's a great blessing. Why? 
because, now I can read Latin, I studied Latin, I, it would not be as crushing a blow for me as it would be for some people, but I'll tell you something, I can't pray the Mass, all right, the words of the Mass, I can't pray them from the heart without being able to think in that language. There's just a certain layer there that impedes me. Now, you're, you're, you have to know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to enter actively into the prayer of the Mass. Now, admittedly, in Latin, very often, the Mass is celebrated very reverently. And that, and that in itself, with beautiful music, Gregorian chant, that helps you to draw you in to a reverence and a sense of the sacred. That's good. That's very good. That's helpful. But it's not necessary that it be in Latin. I'll tell you, you can do that in English or in any language. But what's happened is, very often, in the words of Cardinal Ratzinger, the celebration of our liturgies has become mundane and lackluster. It doesn't have to be that way, though. And so there's nothing wrong with celebrating Mass in Latin, assisting in the Latin Mass, as long as the bishop is given permission, and he has in this diocese. If the wine is taken out of Mass, does not that go against Jesus' teaching of the New Covenant? Well, I'm not sure what that question means. Obviously, you have, you have to have wine as well as bread for a valid celebration of the Eucharist. It's the bread and the wine that through the mystery of transubstantiation is changed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Now what they might mean in this question that some places we're not allowed to receive uh, the precious blood. And by the way, don't ever call it wine after the consecration. It's not wine anymore. It's not wine. I even, it drives me crazy, Eucharistic ministers even say, well, I, I'm going to minister the wine today. No, you're not. You know, it was wine before. It's the precious blood of Jesus now. That's what it is. We, we have to be careful with words because pretty soon, you know, those words can gradually erode our faith. If we think it's wine, pretty soon we believe that it isn't Jesus, but only a symbol and not really him. So... You receive the entire Jesus under one species or any part of one species. If you received a little fragment of the host, would you receive the entire Christ? Yes, of course. If you receive one drop of the precious blood, would you receive the entire Christ? Yes, of course. But receiving under the form of both species, we receive the consecrated host body of Christ, we receive the precious blood. That's a fuller sign. We're dealing with sign value here. It is a fuller sign. And, and yes, that is something good. And so it, it's a good thing to receive under both species, but it doesn't con concern at all what we're receiving. One or both, it's still the entire Christ. And so if some places you don't receive the precious blood as well, well, it's not as full a sign, but it's still what's important. It's Jesus, the whole Lord. You're not lacking anything. Are miscarried or stillborn babies taken care of by the parents' desire to have them baptism? Not necessarily. There is no solid teaching on this, but I'm going to tell you something, okay? At this point, I, you know, if I were doing this on a computer, I'd put this in brackets and move it off someplace. I'm not teaching you here the doctrine of the faith, okay? That, that's what I'm here to do, is teach you the doctrine of the faith and the catechism. But let me just give you um, something that I believe myself as a theologian. I believe that this is, is a reality, but there's no formal teaching on it. You have, let's say, a baby who's aborted, a stillborn baby. Someone who dies without baptism, an adult. Uh, someone who's killed in a car accident and you think they're not in the state of grace. Is there any hope? Well, of course, there's always hope. We're all one in the body of Christ. All right. From all eternity, I'm going to speak now because I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to speak this way. Maybe somebody in here needs to hear it. Let's say you're a woman who's afraid. You're young, you become pregnant. You have an abortion. 
Later, you regret it very deeply. You are very sorry, and it begins to eat at you, begins to really tear at your conscience. And what can you do after all? You, you begin to think the devil starts working on you too. Well, you did it. You killed the baby. It's too late. Nothing you can do. Not true. Let me tell you something. God is in eternity. God's not merely in time. He's in eternity. From all eternity, he knew you would repent, and he knew you would pray for that baby. And God can reach into the future, and he can take your prayers and your good life, and he can take them back to the moment of that abortion, and he can apply grace. And that baby can receive a special blessing. And that baby then can be shown the faith. Even though it doesn't have the use of reason, God can give it the use of reason for a moment to choose. And the child chooses God. Yes, I would will to be baptized if I had the chance. And the baby can be saved. That's a kind of anticipatory grace, I call it. It is a grace of anticipation. You can pray. You can pray today for someone who committed suicide 25 years ago. God is in eternity. God knew from all eternity you would pray for that person 25 years hence. God, because he's God and precisely because he's God, can reach into the future. He can take your prayers. He can apply them at the moment of that suicide. That person on the way off the bridge can repent and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And they are saved because of your prayers. That is an anticipatory grace. God is in eternity. God can use your prayers efficaciously. And so I pray for all the aborted babies. I pray for anyone who commits suicide. I pray for everybody in despair. I, I pray for Hitler. You say, oh my God, how could you do that? Well, why not? God, from all eternity, knew that I would pray for those people. And you say, but they don't deserve it. And I say, neither do I. And neither do you. Jesus is the one who merits the Father's grace. And so we're all sinners, and so we pray for each other. And you can be an effective power for salvation just by willing it, just by praying. That's what happens when we enter in to the life of Christ. Are Mormon baptisms recognized? No. Are Episcopalian confirmations recognized? No. You, for valid baptism, like I said before, you need valid form and matter. Now, the Mormons have baptism. But if you ask them who the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is, they, have, they, they don't believe what we believe. And Mormons aren't really Christian. Now, they would contest that. But they're not Christian. Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christian. Episcopalians are very much Christian, very Christian. However, they do not have valid holy orders. They do not have apostolic succession. Now some would contend with that too. And so if you don't have a valid bishop, validly ordained, you can't have consecration. If you don't have the valid sacrament of holy orders, because only a, a bishop or a priest can administer confirmation, then you can't have valid confirmation. How can how can some of us be so in love with God and others not? Does everyone receive the gift of faith? Do some say no thanks? Well, God wills not the death of any sinner. God wills that everyone be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God provides sufficient grace for everyone to be saved without exception. However, yes indeed, some say no. How do you say no? Well, you say no by choosing evil and rejecting good rather than choosing good and rejecting evil. Uh, that's quite simply. And even St. Paul said, even the pagans have no excuse because the natural law is written in the heart of every man. The natural law, which is a reflection of the divine law, that guides our actions. And so we don't have an excuse. Everyone has it in their heart, the inspiration to do good and avoid evil. 
The Eucharist does not exist in the Lutheran and Episcopalian Church, true or false? True. It does not. Once again, you have to have a validly ordained priesthood. You need valid holy orders for five of the seven sacraments, right? Only a priest or bishop can confect the Eucharist. You can't be a priest or bishop without valid holy orders, the sacrament. All right, confirmation, the same. Confession or penance, reconciliation also. Okay, anointing of the sick, holy orders itself. Okay, baptism and matrimony are the only two sacraments where you don't need a validly ordained priesthood, the sacrament of holy orders. Sometimes at Mass during the readings, the person done doing the reading will change the wording to be politically correct, such as all men will be changed to all people or all brothers changed to, to add the word sisters. How do you feel about this? Well, basically I say this. Do what the church does. Now, there's two kinds of inclusive language. There's what you could call vertical inclusive language and horizontal inclusive language. Uh, I myself at Mass will sometimes say things like, instead of pray brethren, I'll say pray brothers and sisters that your sacrifice and mine may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. That's okay to do that. Uh, you, you can't change the meaning of the text. Uh, because it even says in the sacramentary, it gives you a couple of options. You know, it can say, you can say pray friends. That's one of the options. So, horizontal inclusive language where, but I'll tell you something, it's really funny. The traditional usage where it says, you know, uses the masculine, uh, in most romance languages, uh, that's inclusive. You know, when you mean men, men, masculine, or men and women, that's inclusive, and you use the masculine form. You know, in Spanish, it's like that. You, you know, if it's, if it's um, ours and it's masculine, nuestro, nuestra, if it's feminine, but if you're talking about both inclusive, nuestro, the masculine form. And that's inclusive, actually. So there's a kind of an inversion of reality there. Inclusive language really is what we've used all along. And there's no intention to, to eliminate women in, in any way whatsoever. That's not the meaning of that whatsoever. Uh, so we, but I don't like to mess with the language in general. Now, there's another kind of inclusive language, vertical inclusive language. That's the language of speaking of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, saying His will, God's will, His will. You know, God our Father, don't mess with that. You mess with that, you're messing with the faith. God didn't reveal Himself as Mother. He revealed Himself as Father. And I don't have a better idea than God. Now, God isn't gender. You know, God doesn't admit of gender. God transcends gender. God includes feminine and masculine, both, because he's the creator. God created us, male and female, he created us. Nothing that's created didn't come from God. And so God transcends gender, but God has revealed himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, when Jesus assumed a human nature, you better believe it's masculine. Jesus is the Son of God, and His human nature is a masculine human nature, and, and you know, it's pagan worship to put up Christa on the cross. Pagan worship. And, you know, run, if you ever see that. I, I wouldn't even stay in a place that did, did that. That's a, that's a sacrilege beyond imagination. If St. Ambrose, if Ambrose uh, says that the power of the blessing prevails, then why does it matter if the Eucharist is made from unleavened bread? Well, it's still valid, okay? Let's say in the Roman Rite, which prescribes unleavened bread, let's say you would use leavened bread. Is it still valid? Yes. You still have a valid mass. Yes, if it's leavened bread. Leavened bread means there's yeast, right? It's still valid, but it's illicit. Why? 
because Jesus gave the church the power to administer the sacraments and to prescribe discipline. And if the church says in the West that we use unleavened bread, then we use unleavened bread. And I don't have a better idea than Christ's own body, than the magisterium. Why do we use unleavened bread? Because that's what was used at the Paschal meal. That's what Jesus offered up. And so that matter of the original offering of the Eucharist was unleavened bread. But is leavened bread, as is sometimes used in the East, is that valid matter? Yes, it's valid matter. It's licit in the East, but illicit in the West. And so if you used uh, leavened bread uh, in, the, in the Latin rite, Roman rite, it's still valid, but it's illicit. I don't want to do illegal things in the church. God's not going to smile on me for disobeying the church. And so we do what the, the church prescribes. Is the validity of the sacrament of baptism affected by the fact that neither godparent is a practicing Catholic? Fallen away. No, the validity is not affected by that. The, it's still valid. What you need is the intention of the minister. He intends to baptize. He has a valid form and matter. Water, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The baptism's valid. Don't worry about it. Why, why isn't marriage outside the Catholic Church seen as valid marriage? Oh, it is. Marriage outside the Catholic Church is valid for someone who's not Catholic. Right? Hey, two Lutherans get married in the Lutheran church. That's a valid marriage. They exchange vows. You better believe that's a valid marriage. But for a Catholic to marry outside the church and to have defective form, that's not valid for a Catholic. Why? Because Catholics are held to Catholic discipline in Catholic worship. And so that's why people that are, they drift away from the church and let's say they they would get married um, by justice of the peace or something. Uh, they have a very simple way to be reconciled. It's called a defective form annulment. They don't have to go through the whole process to see if their marriage was invalid to begin with. Well, we know it was because we didn't have the, the valid form of the marriage, defective form. No, no witness, no priest deacon to witness it in the name of the church. Defective form. So it's it's not valid. For a Catholic, it's not valid to be married outside of the Catholic Church. Uh, what step do I need to do if I'm not sure whether I was confirmed? Well, if you can, you should go to the parish that you think maybe you were confirmed in and check. They record those things. Uh, if you can't do that for some odd reason, um, you can a, a sacrament when we're not sure. Remember the three sacraments I told you couldn't be repeated, baptism, confirmation, and holy orders? If you're not sure if you were validly baptized, if you're not sure if you were validly confirmed, you, don't, you can't get the proof, the documentation, you can go to your parish priest and tell him that. And after a, a search or a review, he said, well, we can't find anything. You can have what's called a conditional administration of the sacrament. Conditional baptism, conditional confirmation. You know, if you, if you haven't, if you have not received baptism, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So it's a conditional administration of the sacrament. Normally you can find out, though, if you were baptized or confirmed, because it's in the registration of parishes, and they keep it forever. Unless it was burned up or something, and you really don't know, then, uh, then you can be conditionally baptized or confirmed. Where does it say and why does it say? I've, I saved this one to last. I, I don't, I, I've, I've gone through this a couple times before. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'm, I'm going to just conclude with this. Because th someone gave me an article a little earlier. And sometimes, you know, you can be upset by these articles that you see in the media or on television or something. Don't, don't be upset by these things. One of the reasons we're doing this course for you in the catechism, uh, we, we want you to be confirmed in the faith. I want you to be solid in the faith. Your bishop wants you to be solid in the faith. If you're solid in the faith, you're less likely to become upset 
when something bad goes on because you know that you're right. You know you have the faith. You're not threatened by some of the bad things that go on. A lady gave me a, an article in it, said that 10 groups in the church are signing petitions uh, like they did in, in France and Germany, and they're going to present these petitions to the Pope. You know, you get enough, like a ballot, you know, like Proposition XYZ in California, right? You, you have that, that method. Well, and so they're going to get enough signatures, and they're going to show the Pope what they think. And they're going to say, look, we want women ordained priests. We want celibacy to be optional. We want this. We want the other thing. So what? <laughs> The Catholic Church never was, is not, nor will it ever be a democracy. And we do not rule by consensus. Jesus said at Caesarea Philippi, Who do men say that I am? He took a Gallup poll. And some said John the Baptist, and some said Elijah, and some said Jeremiah. We add them all up. 14 said Jeremiah, 26 said Elijah. What happened? Did Jesus say, oops, most of them said I must be Jeremiah, so I guess I am? No. <laughs> One man had the answer. Peter, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus said, for, for I, for my part, Peter, declare to you that you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. Listen, folks. Your faith is built on a rock. And those issues are clear. Those issues are clear. The Holy Father recently defined the question of women's ordination, so-called. It's not possible. No more could you consecrate that Coca-Cola I told you about into the blood of Christ. Then can a woman be, woman be ordained a priest? And not because she's less than a man. A woman is every bit a Christian and a human is a man. And I'll tell you, women are probably smarter than men. They're certainly better looking. And so there isn't anything. There, there's, there, you're not cheated there. But let me tell you something. I think one of the most noble and highest things in the universe is to be a mother. I will never be one. But I'm not getting up a petition to say that it's unfair. We have to act in accordance with our nature. That's how we become happy and at peace. And so look, I'm going to clarify it once and for all. Where does it say and why does it say that women cannot be priests? I'm asking as a young Catholic, and I would like to defend the church when confronted on this issue. It is an important issue, and so I'm going to say it one more time. It is a part of the doctrine of the faith. Why? Because it's one of the seven sacraments that we talked about today. Holy orders is one of the seven sacraments instituted by Jesus Christ. On Holy Thursday at the Last Supper, he called twelve, and he instituted the priesthood and the Holy Eucharist. All twelve of them were men, and his mother, the most noble, the most beautiful, the most holy of creatures, was not among them. And it's not because she was less than them. She's more than all of them. No priest that ever lived is more holy, beautiful, and noble than that woman, Our Lady. And so Jesus himself instituted the priesthood at the Last Supper, the day before he suffered and died on the cross. Twelve he called. Twelve were men. Twelve men. No women, no Christa instituted the priesthood. Christ the Lord instituted the priesthood. I don't have a better idea than God. We don't make it up as we go along. We accept what we've received, and we hand it on faithfully. That's the faith. Don't try to mess with it. Don't try to water it down. If you find it hard to accept, pray, and God will enlighten your understanding. The priesthood was established by Christ. As such, it's an essential element of the faith because it's one of the seven sacraments. As such, you will find it in three places. Sacred Scripture, I just talked about that. 
That's in the Bible, the Gospel. Sacred tradition from the beginning. The apostolic teaching, the apostolic tradition is only men can be called to the sacrament of holy orders. That tradition has passed down unbroken throughout the ages. And magisterial teaching, it is only the magisterium which can authentically and authoritatively interpret the word of God, whether written in the Bible or spoken and handed down through apostolic tradition. And so the witness of tradition is as unanimous as the witness of scripture and magisterial teaching has remained the same. It's part of the doctrine of the faith. It's part of the truth. And the truth, because it is Jesus, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as the letter to the Hebrews says, therefore, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. And let me tell you the punchline. Anyone who obstinately refuses to accept that teaching in virtue of the act of their refusal to accept that teaching is excommunicated late sententiae because that teaching is part of the doctrine of the faith and by definition, the definition of heresy, a willful, obstinate, post-baptismal denial of a truth of the faith which must be believed with Catholic and divine faith. The Holy Father said, that's the case. The Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith affirmed what the Holy Father said and said, that's the case. The case is closed. And anyone, anyone, be they bishop, priest, religious, or lay faithful who goes against that, let them know and let them know well. They cut themselves off from the body of Christ for they refuse to accept a matter of the doctrine of the faith. As the Holy Father said, a matter of the utmost importance because it concerns the very divine constitution of the church herself. And so let the case be closed. Let no one frighten you with that kind of talk and know very well that if it ever happens that someone goes against that teaching and breaks from the apostolic faith, that is not where Christ is residing. That is not the true church. That will be schismatic. That will be heretical. Stay far away from false teaching, for it is poison, it is darkness, and it is death. Rather, abide in the light, for the light is truth. And Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I received a little letter here or a flyer from someone. It's entitled, What is the Responsibility of Catholic Political Leaders to the Moral Law of the Church? And then it goes on to talk about what happened concerning this partial uh, birth abortion ban, you know, in California. We voted on it. Now, partial birth abortions, abortion is, is bad enough. But these partial birth abortions are closer to infanticide than anything. Uh, they're horrible. I, I don't want to go into it, but you know what it is. I, I don't have to, to tell you that. Well, on May 31, 1996, under California's Capitol Dome, the position of the Holy Father, the bishops, cardinals, was totally ignored by a great many Catholic legislators. Assembly Bill 2984, a measure to ban partial birth abortions in California and less specific requirements were met, was defeated by a vote of 36 to 35 by the California Assembly. <clears throat> it goes on to list a majority of the Catholics in the Assembly who voted against this state ban. Catholics who voted against this. In other words, they voted to allow partial birth abortions. Where are they in terms of the faith? I'll tell you another safe bet that I can make. The day is coming 
sooner rather than later, I hope, where the bishops, having girded their loins and stiffened their backbones, will begin to excommunicate those who take positions like that. It is totally unconscionable, unthinkable, and hellish that anyone could claim to be Catholic and vote for that kind of abomination in a state or federal government. You are not Catholic, legislators, senators, whoever you are. You're not Catholic. And the bishops wake up and excommunicate them as an act of charity because it's gone on too long, much too long. Death is reigning in this country, and a legacy of death is not what we want to hand on, not in the annals of the church in this country or the country itself. And so where do those people stand? What's the duty of Catholic legislators? To vote a Catholic conscience. And you can't be Catholic with a conscience formed to that which is evil. Which, that which radiates death. That's not a Catholic conscience. That's not Catholicism. That's diabolic. That's destructive. And so you cannot say, oh, but I'm Catholic, but I support these partial birth abortions or any abortion. No, you're not. You're Catholic in name, but not in fact. That's a reality. My belief is that they have excommunicated themselves in virtue of that act. You will find soon that there will be courageous bishops like Bishop Bruskowitz in Lincoln, Nebraska, like the Archbishop, <laughs> like the Archbishop of Omaha, Nebraska now, that there will be bishops who follow suit, who not tied up with what's so-called politically correct will begin to do what's right, will begin to testify to the truth. And even if, like Jesus, they have to be lifted up on a cross because of that, they, they'll do it. And they'll be accounted great in the kingdom of heaven for having that kind of courage and leadership. And we must pray very much, for they have a difficult job, and it's not easy. Another question. It says in the Bible, all sins will be forgiven except for sins against the Holy Ghost. What is a sin against the Holy Ghost? Okay, the only sin that can't be forgiven is final impenitence. That's what that really means. That's the only sin that can't be forgiven. Any sin can be forgiven if we ask for forgiveness. The only sin, the real sin against the Holy Spirit, that can't be forgiven is final impenitence. I refuse to repent. You go right to your death saying, I will not repent. So God wants to give forgiveness for every sin, of course. But if you say, I don't repent, I'm not sorry, final impenitence, that's the sin against the Holy Spirit. In regards to form and matter, a friend's response to the eggs and sugar recipe for Eucharistic bread, which I mentioned last month, was that even though the matter wasn't the best, never mind the best, it wasn't at all. It's not, it's not that it isn't the best. It's not valid matter, period. Jesus wouldn't deny himself being given to those who received the cake, believing it was truly him. That's the kind of weak-minded thinking that destroys faith. That is totally fallacious. What's my response? Can a person's belief in what they are receiving affect Christ's presence, no, 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 that's an ancient heresy that was condemned centuries ago. You can believe until you're blue in the face that this is a Boston cream pie, but that ain't going to change it, not one bit. And you can believe that that invalid matter is Christ until you turn purple but it's not going to turn in to the body and blood of Christ because it's not your faith which affects the sacramental presence. It's the form, the words of consecration and valid matter, and that's the only thing that will make Christ present in the Eucharist. And the amount of faith that you have or lack thereof 
will not affect the objective presence of the Lord in the Eucharist. Impossible. Absolutely impossible. Of course, faith is important. It concerns our subjective disposition, and we receive more the greater our faith is. But you do not will Christ into existence. That kind of shallow, soft thinking is what leads to the conclusion that any of us can consecrate. Oh, sure, I was home. Somebody that used to teach in a certain diocese for many years who perverted the faith of many is now in my home diocese teaching. And someone asked him, what if we don't have a priest, Dr. So-and-so? Can we confect the Eucharist? Can we consecrate? Of course, we're all priests. What a lie. And so what happens with that kind of misinformation? People begin to believe it. They begin to play games. They begin to say the words of consecration over cookies and cream. What happens? Nothing happens. That's what happens. Nothing happens. No consecration, no body and blood of the Lord. Be soft-hearted. Don't be soft-headed. Listen to the teaching of the church. Accept it for what it is. And don't listen to those specious arguments. In our parish, we have general confession. We write our sins on a paper. The priest reads them to himself. Then he burns the paper and gives us individual absolution Why we are standing there. Is this valid? Well, I'm not quite sure exactly what is done. I don't know why you would write your sins on a paper. If you wrote them on a paper and gave them to the priest right there, face to face, why wouldn't you tell them, no, auricular confession is necessary. You have to articulate your sins to the priest. You have to speak your sins to the priest. That's part of the matter of the sacrament. In this diocese, general confession and general absolution are not permitted. And so what do you do? You go to confession. You confess your sins. You receive absolution. You go on, the next guy goes in. That's the way we do it. That's the way the church does it. Can you explain why the bishops allow condoms in some circumstances? Well, they don't. <laughs> but you say, but yes, they do. In France, you know, the Conference of Bishops said so. In the 4th century, in the early 5th century, in the East, almost every bishop went over to the Arian heresy. And St. Athanasius alone stood fast in the true faith. A bishop, a cardinal, a pope, anyone, does not have the ability to change the unchanging teaching of Jesus Christ. Now, what's the teaching? The use of condoms is a means of artificial contraception. Is, it, is it the use permitted? No. But to spread AIDS, is it permitted? To stop the spread of AIDS, is it permitted? No, because why? We could give us, we could, in that statement, we could make, be making an unwitting statement that we're condoning that kind of sexual activity. And, and we're not. We're not. Promiscuous sexual activity, whether homosexual or heterosexual, is grossly, intrinsically evil. In the current teaching, can we make an exception? No. But the bishops did it in France. They're wrong. They're wrong. That's all there is to it. And I assure you they've been corrected by the Holy See. And if they push their luck, they'll be corrected more forcefully. So the person who wrote this was confused, and rightly so. I'm confused by this. Well, don't be confused. Some people will go off. Even bishops can go off. They mean well. No one did that out of malice. They mean well. But the norm is, the teaching is, it's not permitted. On the way back to my pew from communion, I saw a host on the floor. 
I picked up the host, and although it was very dirty, I was going to consume it. My friend said we should give it to the priest. He would know what, what to do. What, what would you do in that circumstance? Well, normally, when you find a host, if it's not too dirty and messed up, you would consume it. But let's say you find one that you just don't want to take a chance doing that. The correct thing, give it to the priest. That was correct. The, what does the priest do with it? Well, he should place it in a container of water, in a ciborium with water in it, and allow it to dissolve. Allow it to dissolve in the water, and then he would pour that water in the ground or down the sacrarium. That would be the correct way uh, to deal with that. Uh, a lot of times, sadly, we, we find this. Usually, I'll just consume the host, but if, you know, it, it's... Uh, really been trodden underfoot or something and, and you don't want to do that, that's all right. Give it to the priest. He'll dissolve it in water. You say that those who are suffering can be suffering because God really loves you. What if you are not suffering? Does he not love you as much? It's <laughs> a good question. No, my answer to you is stay tuned. And if you have any doubt, you might speak to the good Lord and say, Lord, do you really love me? <laughs> of course, God loves everyone. The meaning of that, however, is those who suffer, God has a special predilection for those souls. Why? Because they come so close to Christ. They meet the crucified Christ in their suffering. And in a manner of speaking, analogously speaking, yes, God does give the greatest share of his suffering to those that he wants to draw closest to himself, but it doesn't mean he doesn't love the rest of us. You know, if I were in sports and I were a boxer and I had a coach who loved me uh, and he wouldn't put me in the heavyweight championship, would I think, oh, you don't want what's best for me, coach. How come I'm not fighting for the heavyweight championship, because you'll get knocked out. That's why. You're not ready. So how about trying it at a lower level? Well, we all undergo certain difficulties in life, certain sufferings at some level, emotional, if not physical, spiritual. We have trials and tribulations. And I have a good friend who's a Carmelite prioress. And she has often said to us, but Father, I've had such a good life. I've not suffered at all. I've had a wonderful life. Where does that leave me? And I tell her, oh, Mother, you've, you've, lo you've lived a beautifully penitential life. You don't recognize it because you're so in love with the Lord. But stay tuned. It's not over yet. You haven't, gone, you haven't died and gone to heaven. You know, in, in, in one day, God can bestow an infinity of suffering on a soul. You know, a, a thousand years are like a, a day or an hour or a minute come and gone to the Lord. So, so don't, don't worry about that. God loves you, and he loves you with a tremendous love, an infinite love. And because he preserves us today from suffering, that's a sign of love too. But if tomorrow he chooses to love you with a different embrace, then don't be afraid. It's just a sign of his love. He's not rejecting you. He's drawing you closer. I remember a certain couple talking to a Protestant minister who's a great preacher, and they were lamenting the fact that they, they had a, a severely crippled and, and handicapped child that was born to them. And they said, is it because God perhaps doesn't love us as much, or is this punishment of some kind? And, and this Protestant minister who was born with cerebral palsy, said to them, Oh, no, no. He said, God just trusts you more than he does most people to bring up this beautiful child. God trusts you more to give you such a blessing to nurture and educate that child, to love that child all the way to the kingdom. No, God's not punishing you. God's blessing you. God's showing you how much he loves you and how much he trusts you. And so God loves us all. 
and he does trust us all because he's entrusted us with his son in the Eucharist. He's entrusted us with his bride, the church. He's entrusted us with everything good and true and holy and noble. Love is repaid by love alone. I find myself envying those who don't know some things are wrong. They appear to be having more fun. <laughs> well, then you rue the day you ever laid eyes on me. <laughs> I know what you mean. Uh, but listen, your place in heaven, because of the knowledge you do have, and because of your struggle of trying to act in accord with that higher knowledge, that will gain you a much higher place in heaven than those people will ever have. Be assured of that. You know, you, you can have fun now, or you can be happy in heaven forever. It's like the Midas man said, you can pay me now, or you can pay me later. In the last issue of the Catholic Herald, there were two opposing commentaries on how we should deal with panhandlers. Both had very valid points. Could you please enlighten me as to the church's position on this matter? Well, the church doesn't have a formal position on many, many matters. Now, this is a tough one. You know, in the last class, I, I told you about my experience in San Francisco. We see a lot of sad things. If you've ever been to Rome, when I went to Rome to be ordained, I saw there were more panhandlers. There are more panhandlers in Rome on the approach to the Vatican than any place else in the, in the world, I think. The, the gypsies go there, and the gypsy women will dress up in their black clothes, and they have the poor little children, they, they get them, and they put dirt on their faces, and they look so pitiful, and they train them how to look miserable. Padre! Padre. Believe me, most of it is an act. The gypsy godfather, one of them there, someone told me, owns one of the largest hotels in Rome. You know where the money came from? From the kid holding out his hand. Padre. Well, that's the truth. That goes on. Now, there are panhandlers, there are people who make a lot of money doing that for a living. I feel that it's stealing from the poor. Uh, we don't know who they are always, and you can't always assume that the person who comes up to you is a crook. A lot of them are crooks today, you know, plain English. But not all. Some people are down on their luck. Some people are, you know, in the street, homeless. And so, you know, I can't tell you who's who. Uh, I have to admit that, you know, if I were to know, uh, here's what I usually do. Rectories have a problem. I lived with a priest in Florida for a while, and he was the kindest man, and everybody knew it, and everybody took advantage of it. And every panhandler in that part of Florida knew to go there if you needed help. This man would give away his salary by the end of payday. And then he was broke. Well, I'm not going to criticize him for that. Now, it's true that that could be enabling a vice. You know, to do that is a vice, you know, the people that, that take the money. But he was very simple in his approach. I, I don't know. And if they come and ask me, what if they're poor? What if they really are poor and they're not a panhandler? What if it's Jesus? come to ask me to be kind. And so I sympathize with that. And so, you know, I'm not going to give you the answer to that because I don't know it. But I do know that there are, that there are a couple of different ways of looking at it. And there's, there is, like the note said, there's truth in both sides. But I personally believe that those who, you know, make a living at it and, and who could be working are stealing from the poor. Because I'll tell you what happens. After a while, you know, you wait, you, people don't like to be hustled. And once you find out you've been hustled, you're much less likely to give the next time to a really poor person. And so I think that those people can really be stealing from the poor. But I don't know always who's who.
And so you have to use some discernment and, and, and try to figure that out. The Bible says, call no man father. Here's one of my favorite ones. How can I explain to non-Catholics why we, why we call priests father? Well, there's only one father, God, our father. There's only one priest. Jesus Christ is the only priest. We enter into the paternity of God our Father and make it present. And it is the paternity of the Father that's made present through the paternity of the priest, just as we enter into the priesthood of Jesus Christ and make it present, becoming, as it were, multiple subjects of his sacramental action. And so, yes, one father, yes, one priest, but we aren't setting up some kind of separate paternity, which is what that passage deals with. We are entering into and making present the paternity of God our Father. We are fathers. That if you carry that, then don't call dad father. Don't call your own father father. You know, if you want to use that logic, then don't call your natural father father. Is that what the church teaches? No. You can call your, your daddy father. Why? Because he has entered into the paternity of God our Father and manifested it. He's entered into God's creative power with his spouse, procreated, brought a child into being. Hence, he makes God's paternity present. The priest, a spiritual father likewise, makes God's paternity present. Father, what did you do about the poor drunk, down-and-out man, that reminded you of Christ. <laughs> you know, you ask for questions, you get them. <laughs> well, I tried to help him. I tried to wake him up after a while, and I couldn't. He was so big. He was, I don't know, 250 pounds. At least a big man. He was unconscious. I, I was in a strange place. I didn't know what to do. I tried to ask someone, how can you help someone like the police or some? They won't do anything. They, they won't, you know, there's so many of them. Now, I, I'm, I'm admitting to you something. I, I don't know whether to repent of it or I didn't know what to do, honestly. I'm being honest with you. I wanted to help him. It broke my heart. Broke my heart. Uh, and, I, and I tried to do something tangible, physical, to, you know, you, you want to feed the hungry. You do want to take, take care of those who are sick or unable to take care of themselves. We want to, like Mother Teresa, what a wonderful example. I hope you're all praying for her. Uh, Mother is, as you know, very sick right now. Um, you know, she's been praying for us, you know. She's been offering her penances and sufferings for the success of this program from the beginning. I think I announced that once, but uh, we have a friend who knows her personally, and I, I'm going to do their annual retreat in December for the Missionaries of Charity, and Mother is supposed to be there for the retreat, and after that there'll be profession of vows, but now she's so sick, so I hope you're praying for her. But, you know, she's such a good example of how to take care of the poor, the poorest of the poor. She reaches out to them. She tries to take care of them. How can she do it? She sees Jesus in them. That, was, that experience I had was an unusual, radical kind of experience that's never happened to me like that before. But it was a great blessing because it illustrated to me that no matter how miserable a person is, no matter how down and out, how dirty, how sick, how drunk, how sinful, how whatever. Because they're human, made in God's image and likeness, there you will find Jesus if you have eyes of faith. I will pray for that man for the rest of my life. That man, his soul has no chance of escaping our prayers. I guarantee you that that man will be talked about all over the country. Every place I go, people will hear about that man 
and I will ask all of you to pray for that man. I don't know his name, and you don't either, but we will pray for him. And anyone else that we see, I go around collecting souls. I, I walk around, you know, and I see, and I, and I start with the worst ones. I have been praying for Madonna for a long time. <laughs> now I fully expect to find her in heaven. And, and you should pray for her too. Because anyone with a name like that certainly has a mother in heaven praying for her. The real Madonna is certainly praying for that wayward daughter of hers. And so, and no one is beyond God's grace. I don't care who it is and what they do. God wills not the death of any sinner. God wills to save everyone. I would love to catechize Madonna and put her in a convent someday, someplace. <laughs> Pray for that. Okay, another question. I'm glad you're feeling better. Thank you. We prayed for you. Thank you. There, okay, th this is concerning a person who has shared with another person that they're having an adulterous relationship. But this person doesn't want to hear uh, the truth, okay? The person in that adulterous relationship doesn't want to hear the, the truth, and I'm afraid to say anything about it. Am I committing a sin by not saying anything. Okay, I, that's a good question. I'm glad it was asked because I, you know, sometimes it's hard to say everything in one breath when you're giving a teaching. It is true that we have a, an obligation to speak the truth, to defend the truth, but there are times you have to have some discernment. Okay, things are received according to the disposition of the receiver. Okay, there are times when a friend of yours, a relative, can be live, doing, committing some terrible sin. Now, you know it. They know it, too. But you're uneasy. You can tell that they're not open. They're not receptive. If, if you would bring it up and say, why don't you stop that? You know, get away from that relationship. You know they'd blow up and, and distance you. you. You would drive them away. Now, you pray about it. You pray about it. Perhaps you fast, you do penance, you ask the Lord for an answer, you invoke the Holy Spirit. I've had to do this many times. Now, after all, I'm a priest. Most of you are not priests. I have a doctorate in theology. Most of you don't have a doctorate in theology. There are, very often, there are times when I can't do any more than you can. And I pray about it, and, and you know, it, it, the Lord seems to say, ah, ah, back off, love the person, Love them, pray for them, do penance for them, offer your, self, your sufferings for them, and they will then come in my time. Only God can change a heart. Be very vigilant, though, for signs that they're ready. And so some people are not ready to hear the gospel. And so you pray for them, you intercede for them. And then they will come to you. I have had this happen time and time again. I knew they weren't ready. I've had it happen with relatives, with friends, with acquaintances. People say, Father, please talk to my brother, my son, whatever. And I sense that they're not ready. Boy, if I give them any doctrine or moral teaching, they're going to rebel. They're going to just throw me right out, dismiss me. And so I just try to be as kind and as gentle and as loving towards them as I can. And then, boy, I go back and storm heaven. And that's what you do, too. And I'll tell you, then what will happen, they'll come to you, or they'll go to someone else. God knows who to send his children to, and they will be helped. Okay, so it's not a sin every time when, you know, don't feel that every single time you've got to storm in and say, you're committing adultery, stop that, you're going to hell. Oh, no, no. You, you can't do that every time. Sometimes, yes, you have to witness to the truth, yes. But have some discernment. You know, that, that has to do with that prudence. You know, that, that has to do with, with a certain kind of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and counsel. Give to the Holy Spirit. What about war uh, to preserve a country's right to freedom? Is this violence, which under the illusion of fighting evil, only makes it worse, 
Well, war is a horrible evil. Yes, right. Very often wars are fought, are fought uh, too quickly without exhausting all other possibilities. I suggest if you want, we've, we've, um, we're going to be covering it soon, uh, maybe next class, uh, the teaching on the fifth commandment, on the right to legitimate self-defense. Now, uh, is it ever just to fight a war? Yes. There is a right to legitimate self-defense. Uh, can, can you, well, World War II, okay? Hitler, Nazi Germany, an evil empire by any stretch of the imagination. The men, that, that, the men and women that went off to fight in World War II, uh, were they committing a sin? Was this some violence they entered in? Absolutely not. Usually they were heroic. The founder of my order, who was a very holy man, was a SEAL, the predecessor of today's Navy SEALs. He was a UDT, frogman, underwater demolition. He told me that the reason that he enlisted in the armed forces during World War II was out of a sense of loyalty to God, number one, who was a God of goodness and justice, and his country, number two. But he and many others believed, with all their heart, that they were fighting outright evil. And so, yes, there is a right to legitimate defense. War is a horror. We are to avoid it. We are to cultivate peace. But there are times that come in the life of a nation or an individual where there is a right to legitimate self-defense, not only a right, but at times an obligation. If you read further in the teaching on the Fifth Commandment, you will find that some people, like fathers of families or leaders of nations, not only have a right, but an obligation to defend those that are in their care. Can an Episcopal priest marry? If so, could he at a later date become a Catholic priest, even if he has had children? and remains married? If so, what is the church's reasoning? Well, interesting that you ask that. One of the great blessings I've been given lately is to have from three completely unrelated directions, three Episcopal priests get in touch with me. One or two of them was from different places in the country through Mother Teresa. They had contacted her and asked her, about it. And the sisters in San Francisco, the missionaries of charity, referred them to me. So I'm dealing with this right now. Three different Episcopal priests. I, I had a letter from one this week. Of, I had written to him already. He had asked me some hard questions, and I'd given him some hard answers. Wasn't giving him any easy way out, and boy, I got a letter back, and he was so thankful. I was so edified by the letter. Can an Episcopal priest marry? Yes. Yes, many of them, if not most, are married. If so, could he at a later date become a Catholic priest? Well, it depends. Right now my order is helping to facilitate the entrance into the Catholic Church of 2,500 Anglican priests in England through Cardinal Basil Hume. But, but, there are requirements. Obviously, the man, the Episcopal priest, would have to believe what we believe. This beautiful letter I had this week from this man, oh, I, you know, I, I, maybe I, I, if I had it, I'd read it to you. He said, to the effect, Dear Father, I was so happy to receive your letter, and even happier when I found out that you're loyal to our Holy Father. Pope John Paul II. For me, that's the acid test, he said. This is, an Angl this is an Episcopal priest saying this. And I had told him about a certain school of theology that isn't so particularly trustworthy and a lot of dissonance. Oh, I'm well aware, he said, and I'm, you know, working with that. And he said many beautiful things. Now, <clears throat> can an Episcopal priest and principal be brought into the Catholic Church? Yes, of course, it's been done, sometimes with their entire parish, all right? So what would they do? The, he would, the, the man would study, 
Now, they already know a lot of theology, but they would have to study an amount of Catholic theology to make sure they know what we believe. And then they would have to be ordained in the Catholic Church. Now, the question is, well, well, could they do that even though they're married and have children? Yes. Going back to the teaching on holy orders, remember that the fact that a man has a wife and is married doesn't immediately eliminate him from the possibility of ordination. A, a priest can never marry. But a married man, as witness the Eastern Catholic rites, they, they, uh, they can take a wife and then be ordained. All right? So, so the man's already married. He can be ordained and then function as a Catholic priest. That's not like women's ordination, which is a theological impossibility. This is a theological possibility. So uh, there is a, a thing called the Anglican usage rite. It's a, a, um, a litur liturgy, a rite, that's very close to the Anglican rite that they use in the Anglican church. There are so many Anglican priests and Episcopal priests desirous of entering the Catholic Church that we have to respond to this. We, it's, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the Church opens her arms as a good mother. Many of these men uh, are, are men of faith. They're good men. And so we want, to, we want to be able to do that. So it's possible for a married man to be ordained. Even some of the apostles probably were married men when they were ordained. But we don't do that in the current discipline of the Roman rite, the Latin rite, because we, feel, we know the great value of celibacy in the priesthood. But we recognize that in the Eastern rites, that has been their tradition, and we, we honor it. And taking that logic, we apply it to the case of the Anglican or Episcopal priest. Okay. How can it be right not to allow a child the right to be brought into this world being wanted or to be conceived by the free will of both parents? I am questioning the right to an abortion from incest or rape. How can we make something right that was wrong? This should, should be a choice because there will also be mental suffering in both the child when he comes to realize how he came into this world and the parent living with the violation of their human rights that occurred. I do not believe in abortion except for these circumstances. Should we not make allowances when the circumstances call from, for compassion? I submit to you that it is not compassion to murder someone who came to be through unfortunate circumstances. What is the higher right and the higher good? There, this is very dangerous thinking, and I know you ask the question because you're a good person and you're interested in, in doing what's right and what's compassionate and what's good. The highest thing there is is existence. The most preeminent right or good is existence. Let's say we don't bring that, that child into the world. That child Sure, the deck may be stacked against that child, but I want to tell you something. The deck is stacked against a lot of us. A lot of us come into this world with, with all kinds of problems. We have to give the child a chance to live. That child could grow up to be a saint. Don't buy that specious reasoning that of necessity that child is going to turn out no good unwanted. A lot of people start out unwanted and then become great persons in this world. Once there was a couple and they had several children and several of those children were born deformed, deaf, blind, with all kinds of problems, mental illness. And finally, the doctor, the, the woman was pregnant again, and the doctor said, look, you've, been, you've just had too much trouble. Now, you've got to abort that baby. Stop this. You're hurting society. 
And so they were Catholic and they prayed about it and they thought about it and they said, no, we can't do it. We'll have the child. The child was born deaf. The child today is known as Beethoven. And some would argue that a great deal of good came to humanity through the life of, of Beethoven. Someone told me when we were at this retreat in Oregon last week, we were talking and one of the young women said uh, her mother conceived and was told there would be an ectopic pregnancy and that it was a danger to her life and probably that the mother would die. And so the doctor strongly encouraged a termination of that pregnancy because surely we need to preserve your life. And they prayed about it and they talked about it and they said, no, we cannot do that. The child has been conceived. The child exists. And so if I have to die trying to bring that child into the light of day, then so be it. And of course, that child was the one telling us the story. And so it is true that rape and incest are horrible things. But do we add murder on top of those evils? What manner of logic is that? And so a human being is a human being, and that dignity and that grace and that gift transcends any other consideration. The good of being is a good which transcends everything else. Imagine, let me show you the logic here. <clears throat> Imagine someone would be conceived and born, and that person was destined to live a horrible life, rejected, a mo mother a prostitute, father a drug addict, come into the world like that, abused from when they were little. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, let's say they were born into a family of Satanists. And from the beginning, those Satanists abused that child. And the father and the brothers of that little child, when she became a teenager, got her pregnant, and they used those babies in a black mass. And that person went from bad to worse and suffered for a very long time and carried the scars of it. If you had known all that would, ha was, would happen and you were the parent, would you say, no, let it not be? If you could have said in the beginning to God, no, let that child not come to be, would you say that? Many people would say, yes, I would prevent that. Bad choice. The person exists. And let me tell you, I know that person I described. And that person once went to confession to me. And that person once got baptized in the basement of a church by me. And that person followed me all around the country listening to us preach. And that person is a pillar of, a church, of the church and a good mother to her children and a good wife to her husband. Would it have been better that she never be born? Well, some might think so for about 30 years. But there's all the rest of her life left to become a saint. And so we need to be careful with how we think. Do we try to be a saint, or are we already a saint? <clears throat> I have heard that before, and even St. Paul talks about the saints. You know, he addresses the people of God as the saints. And in a manner of speaking, I can call you saints. I don't usually do that because I don't want you to get too comfortable. But yes, you're in a state of grace, you're friends of God, you're members of his church, his family. And so in a manner of speaking, you know, we're members of the body of Christ. We're part of the communion of saints, all those in a state of grace here, all those in purgatory, all those in heaven, communion of saints. But we're on the way, we haven't arrived yet. And so I don't use the term very much because, you know, I, I'm in a pretty good place today, I think. But I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow or next year, and I know very well that I'm not yet in heaven, even though I enjoy your company. <laughs> but I think we have something else to look forward to. When I get to heaven, then I think I can rightly be called a saint, because the saints are those blessed who are in heaven. And so I think after we've arrived, we can feel more comfortable 
with the terms. What do you say to college-level teachers who are teaching students that man came from apes? Well, you will tell the following story to them that my friend, Father Peter Wood from Florida, told. When he was a newly ordained priest, he was sent to a new parish in the town of Apalachicola, Florida. And he found out that there was a county fair in Apalachicola that weekend. And so he didn't really know anybody, but so he went to the county fair, and there was a country and western band just tuning up, and there was going to be a concert. So Father Peter said he went over and bought a hot dog, and he got ready to uh, listen to this concert. And so the good old boys tuned up, and one of them started a song, and it began like this. I ain't no kin to a monkey. Don't you dare call me kin to a monkey. No, I ain't no kin to a monkey. And so what you do is you learn that song, and you sing that to the teacher. <laughs> and if they are in sin, they will have done penance listening to you. <laughs> My name is Cece, seven years old, Cecilia. You are so good. I like you. Well, I like you too. I'm going to do a rare thing. I'm going to let one of you ask one more question. Yes. The what? Promise keepers? Yes. I, I'm, I'm not real, from, I'm somewhat familiar with it. Promise keepers. I think the concept of it uh, once again, I don't know a great deal about it, but what I know about it seems to be uh, very good. These promise keepers are men. Men, Christian men, come together and they have kind of conferences and it's an attempt to try to get men, family men mostly, fathers, to live up to their responsibilities as Christian spouses and fathers more. Uh, it's had great success as far as I know they fill up football stadiums, and, and they really have a, a, a tremendous time of it. Uh, I was once asked uh, to speak at one in Denver, and because they haven't had a great Catholic presence, uh, at least then, uh, I think it's a good idea. I, I'll tell you, there are a lot of dads today, more than moms, in our society uh, who don't who don't live up to their responsibility as fathers and husbands. And when that happens, society unravels. And that's what's behind a lot of our problems in society. Very often, well, all the way across the board, but there's a, uh, I don't know his name, but he's a, he's a Baptist preacher, African-American man. He's a wonderful preacher. Uh, I, I listened to him on tape when I was in Wyoming once giving a retreat. And, and this man was just tremendous. And he, he talked about men living up to their vocation as father, not abdicating it. And he, talk about, he talked about men not becoming womanized, sissified creatures. Be a man. Be a man and live up to your responsibility as a man. Be a real husband to your wife and a real father to your children. And he talked about the Fido mentality. And he talked about young men who go around acting like dogs. And, you know, that, that whenever they see a female, that they go in heat. And he said, don't have the Fido mentality. Your dignity is beyond that. And he talked in this kind of way. Very simple, straightforward, he was really humorous. But I'll tell you something. If men would live up to their responsibility, we wouldn't have a great deal of trouble with the women. For some reason, women in general, not always, but in general, uh, women have a sense for what's good. Women aren't usually the ones 
who cause most of the problems. Now, I know there are exceptions, but usually it's the men. You know, the men are running off here, and the men aren't living up to their responsibilities. So Promise Keepers is trying to deal with that. They're trying to address that. They're trying to get men to see that it's great to be a dad. It's a wonderful blessing to be a Christian father and a Christian husband. That's a great vocation. I talked about that all week in Oregon last week to families. I talked about the two most noble, beautiful vocations, that of being a mom and a dad. There was one I remember, I, I'm not going to look through all these, but there was one that was, I picked out because I thought it was very good. It said, we know that when we confess our sins and we have contrition, we know God forgives us. But what about if you, if you keep committing those sins over and over again, indicating to you that maybe you don't really have a firm purpose of amendment. All right, that's a very good question and a very important question. Very often, people get into a pattern of sin, and they do commit the same sins over and over and over again. It's like a downward spiral, a death spiral, and they can't seem to break out of it. And, and they hate the sin that they're committing. Oh, on one end, you say, well, they love the sin. Well, they're doing it. But they hate it in a way. They wish they weren't. Jesus said, the man who sins becomes a slave to sin. People get caught in terrible mortal sins, and they can actually hate them. I've had many people tell me, Father, I commit this, this mortal sin um, habitually, and I hate it. Even when I'm doing it, I'm hating it and crying inside and telling God I'm sorry. And oh, I sympathize with that. I sympathize very greatly with that. And here's the way you have to approach that. You have to do the best you can. Yes, you have to repent. Yes, as best you can, you have a firm purpose of amendment. But what you've got to do is never give up. Never become despondent. Never allow the devil to destroy you through that darkness which says, you belong to me. You'll never change. You're a sinner. Don't ever buy into that. You keep on fighting. Let me tell you something that gives me great consolation. I'm one of the biggest sinners that you'll ever meet. And, and my life has been a terrible testimony to serious sin. Most of my adult life, the last 12 years, God's blessed me. But I'm still a sinner. But for many years, I lived in terrible sin. You know, one day recently, I was reading, it was a, at one of the readings, I think on Sunday, or at least one of the mass readings recently, where Jesus is asked, Lord, if my neighbor offends me, my brother offends me, how many times must I forgive him? Seven? Remember? And our Lord says, I, not, not seven, I tell you 70 times seven. Now that indicates an, an indefinite in, number, an infinite number. Seven is the number of perfection. That's God's number. And God is saying an infinite number of times. Now look, look, look who's giving us counsel here. It's Jesus, eternal truth, God and Son of God. What's Jesus saying? You've got to forgive him an indefinite number of times. Oh, thank you, Lord. I know you will practice what you preach. <laughs> that gives me great consolation. It's got to be true. If we are to forgive our neighbors an infinite number of times, so long as that neighbor comes and forgive me, I'm sorry, of course, that's the heart of God. And so you go to God if it's the millionth time you've committed that sin, but you are sorry for that sin. You're almost desperate. You're trying to get out of it. You hate it, but you just can't seem to break. You go to God, and you go with confidence, and know very well that the Lord who said an infinite number does that himself. No matter how many times you go to him, he will never get tired of seeing you show up on his doorstep and say, Lord, I am sorry. Because when you say that, it's a, it's a demonstration of trust in the divine mercy. And so don't use it, of course, as an excuse to keep sinning. But by all means, let it, let it give you consolation and work hard and keep praying. And pray a lot that God breaks you free. Next month is my mother's birthday, and we plan to take her to a restaurant for dinner on Sunday, which is her birthday. Are we leading others into sin by going to a restaurant on Sunday? Well, I don't think so. Uh, I, you know, it's a, you could look at it from both sides. You know, this is one of those questions, 
It's true that we are not supposed to make it harder for people to rest on Sunday, but by the same token, uh, most of those people in the restaurant would be there probably anyway. Now, I, I, there are two sides. You could say, yeah, but Father, you know, if you show up, you know, if nobody showed up, they couldn't work on Sunday, and maybe they'd, you know, worship God on Sunday. Well, yes, yes, I, I see that, that side of it. I don't, I'm giving you an opinion. I'm not giving you here, uh, there's not a written doctrine on every little thing in the church. I'm giving you an opinion. I, I don't think it's a sin. I think if you take mom, you know, you're doing something for the family, right? It says that right in the catechism. Sunday, you should, it should be a family day, yes. Put God first, but bring God into the context of your family. I personally don't believe that that would be a sin. It's true, we shouldn't make it into a day of commerce. We shouldn't make Sunday a habitual day of commerce and, and constant shopping and, and so forth. But to take mom to dinner on her birthday, I don't, I don't think, in a restaurant, I don't think that that would be a, a sin. How or why are some people demon-possessed? Well, possession is highly unusual, okay? I, I know I alluded to that in, I guess, the last uh, class. But possession is a highly unusual thing. Very rarely occurs. Now, there is something called obsession, which is a lesser degree where the demonic will be involved in the life of a person. How does that happen? Well, usually sin is involved, usually. But sometimes it can happen uh, through various occult practices, dedication, uh, selling of... I've even heard of children that were sold to the devil. I could tell you hair-raising stories uh, of people that I've run into that through no fault of their own when they were children, they were born into families that practice Satanism and so forth. Well, the one thing I can tell you is this. Don't worry about it, because so long as you are in Christ, the devil can't mess with you. Oh, yeah, he'll, certainly he'll take his shots. But there's a great analogy. I like it very much. If there is a very vicious dog, imagine a 300-pound pit bull, and he's chained up on a six-foot chain. Now, this is the advice I'm giving you about the devil. Stay more than six feet away from him, <laughs> and he will not cause you a great deal of harm. Right? A dog on a six-foot chain doesn't do much harm eight feet from there. So just stay out of reach. How do you do that? Don't give yourself to the devil through sin. Don't give them a chance to take a shot at you. It's through sin that we begin to get in trouble. Oh, it doesn't happen all at once, a little bit at a time. But that's, that's the, the main piece of advice. Remain in a state of grace. In this day and age, you're taking a very serious chance to not be in a state of grace for a prolonged period of time. Why? Because you're open season. That's why. You're open season. You're not protected. You don't want to be unprotected in a violent, sick world. Okay, can you, can you elaborate on praying in tongues? Second request. Well, yeah, I, I, I can to a certain extent. I can tell you from my own experience. Now, this, this is one of the things that is not, once again, as I said, not everything uh, has a defined doctrine. The church does not rule on every... We sometimes wish that it would. We wish there'd be a book where there was a dogma that covered every situation in life, but we know that's not true. My own experience, okay? You don't have to agree with me. I have researched it. I have had experience with it. I have heard both sides of the argument. Sometimes in the end, you have to apply the basic spiritual axiom that you know the tree by the fruits. On the second or third anniversary of my conversion, I was in novitiate. My spiritual director and the novice master were, had both been around the charismatic renewal, and I learned things about it. Now, we know that Scripture references a gift called tongues, 
praying in tongues. We know St. Paul exhorted the people to not be too concerned about praying in tongues. It's a lesser gift unless the, the gift of interpretation of tongues were operative in the assembly. It seems that there is such a thing as tongues. Now, it's not just being able to speak in a language that everybody understands. That's one kind of tongues that shows up in, in Scripture. There's a thing called glossolalia. That's prayer in a, a tongue or a voice that is not uh, normally a language that you would know, that you have learned cognitively. A person in a state of grace, all right? A person who is trying to serve God, a person who has been perhaps prayed over by someone who has authority, a priest perhaps, maybe a prayer group in union with him. Now, I'm going to give you my experience. You don't have to agree with me on that. I'm not teaching you uh, some dogma here, and I hesitate even to mention it. But the person asked the question twice, and they have a right, you know, to an attempt at least. My personal experience, the fruits that I've seen, is that, yes, there is such a thing as praying in tongues. Do not immediately jump to a conclusion and think it is of the devil. When I first came in contact with it, that's exactly what I thought. I thought, man, this is bad news. Let me out of here. <laughs> I, this is, get me out. I, and I was mad. I wanted, I didn't want to hear about that. I didn't want to see that. This is some kind of, this isn't Roman Catholicism. I remember thinking that. Through experience, I prayed. Now, my spiritual director was a very, very holy man, the novice master, a wonderfully holy man. I trusted them. I knew they weren't crazy. I knew they weren't evil. And they tried to explain it to me, and they said, you have to experience it. And I said, well, I'm not interested in experiencing that. And so it went on. Well, I'll tell you, it was on the, I believe, the third anniversary of my reconversion to the faith. A very good priest, three of them, prayed over me, and I, nothing happened. And I went for a walk. And, you know, they had said, well, if you will just yield to that gift. It's a gift that almost anybody can receive under the right circumstances. It's not something you will into having. It's something you yield to. And so I said, well, okay, I don't know what that means. But I just went out and I prayed the rosary. Now, the rosary has always been my main form of personal prayer. It's vocal prayer. It's meditative prayer. And it leads you into contemplative prayer. It's the prayer of the gospel. The mysteries, 13 of them are right out of the gospel. So the rosary is wonderful prayer. It's been my main form of prayer back then, now, probably always will be. I was praying the rosary. And all of a sudden, out tumbles, you know how a, a brook or a, um, a spring bubbles up from the ground? Well, this came out. Did I have control over it? Yes. Um, was it out of control? No. No, I could turn it on and shut it off. It was spontaneous. It was real, and I began to say, boy, I'm goofy. I've been listening to these characters a little too long. And I, I said, Lord, you know, I don't want anything to do with this. Nothing to do with this. If this isn't of you, get me out of here fast. Within a minute, a woman shows up. I was on a boat dock, and this woman is walking, and after a while I can see she was sobbing and crying. And this prayer is coming, this prayer in tongues. And I have had for a long time at times the infused gift of contemplation. And it can draw you into a deep peace, and, and that was happening. A tremendously deep peace was coming out of this, this prayer in tongues. And finally this woman was sobbing uncontrollably, and I I, I went over to her, and I, I said, well, uh, what's wrong? Can I help you? And she said, my life is a nightmare. It's a horror. I have no hope. I'm, I, I'm going to kill myself. I'm suicidal. And I began to talk with her, and I began to tell her things about herself. God gave me words that didn't seem to be my own. Maybe they were his. I don't know. The woman changed. In an hour, she was smiling. She had hope. She came to Mass every day. Every day, every day. That was the first thing that I ever saw happen. 
I said, well, maybe that was a coincidence. After all, she could have just walked out there. No, no big deal. The next Sunday, I was after Mass making my Thanksgiving, walking down that same trail through the woods down to the boat dock. And out of the, another trail came a young woman. I was praying the rosary again. And she said, well, let's pray together. And so we prayed the rosary together. And we continued on, the rosary stopped, and then we just were silent. And I began to pray silently in tongues. And then I said to her, how long have you felt you've had a Carmelite vocation? And she looked at me and she said, well, how did you know that? And I said, well, I don't know. And I said, and, and certainly you belong at Carmel in a certain place in New Jersey. And she said, how did you know I have an appointment there on Wednesday? And now, I don't make a big deal out of these things. Maybe you could say, another coincidence, Father. Okay, I wouldn't argue with you. I, I don't push the point. I'm not pushing it. I had several things like that. And I concluded, and I don't push it, and I don't, you know, tell you you have to do that or you've got to pray in tongues. No. Nope. But my personal experience has been very positive. I have had many, many encounters with the forces of evil, many, many times. Spontaneously, I would begin to pray in what's called rebuking tongues. I have seen the power of God work through this. I have seen them run. You ever see a demon set on fire by the word of God? I'll tell you, it's something. I'm telling you there's power in it. You've, you've touched on something. I never talk about this. I never talk about it, and maybe I should. I stick to the doctrine of the faith. You know that. I try to teach faith and morals right out of the book. I try to go right by it. But, you know, every once in a while, somebody will ask a question. It pushes a button, and you, you know me. You know, I don't usually hold back. I've got to tell you the truth. This one you don't have to accept if you don't want to. You don't have to believe me. But I can tell you I've had experience with it. I've had long experience with it. I've had hard experience with it. I have seen the power for good, the power to rout evil. And so I tell you, yes, there is such a thing. It is a gift which is very humble. It is a gift where you yield to the power of God. We are very rational creatures, and we should be, but that doesn't mean we want to become rationalists. That is not a good thing. You know, we become the kind of people, unless I can see it, I don't want to accept it. Unless I can think everything out perfectly, I don't want to pray it. Unless I'm in charge, I won't do it. Well, I say to the Holy Spirit, you are the Spirit of God. You are the breath of God, the Ruach HaKodesh, God's holy breath, the life of God, and you can breathe through me. I am merely an instrument of God, and if you, divine spirit, breath of God, want to go through me as a poor instrument, then do it. And very, very often, great things have happened. What is it? It's God using the instrumentality of our poor little finite human nature to make beautiful music for God. The Holy Spirit knows how to discern the deep things of God. We know not how to pray. The Holy Spirit prays through us with groanings and, and utterances that are beyond human reason. God knows how to pray to God. And it's really quite a humble thing to accept that and to allow the Holy Spirit to work through you, lifting up praise, adoration, thanksgiving, and impetration to God. So what do I think personally? I've been through it. I know something about it. Yes, tongues is an authentic gift in the church, but, you know, it's not the kind of thing that you can quantify. You can't put it under a microscope. You can't measure it. But, and it's not something you're going to find in a number in the catechism. But there are many things that aren't laid out in detail there. You don't have to accept it. I'm not teaching this as something you must accept. I'm just trying to respond in a, in a, as best I can to an honest question with an honest answer. Okay, a jet, well, we don't, well, we don't want to pick on the Jesuits. A, a certain priest, a certain kind of priest. Cat's out of the bag, too late. 
All right, a Jesuit priest preached that it was sufficient to love our neighbor as ourselves. We did not need to love God. Comments, please. You bet. Here they come. To say that all we have to do is love our neighbor and we don't have to love God betrays an underlying total ignorance of spiritual reality. My first question would be, how on earth do you think you're going to love your neighbor without the power you receive from loving God? Impossible. How are you going to do something which is a supernatural thing, loving your neighbor as yourself? And it's, called, it's a supernatural love, not just a mere natural love. That's not what we're called to do. How are you going to do that unless you're, once again, plugged in to the power source? How does that happen? That's your relationship with God. That's the vertical dimension, our relationship with God. After that's established and we're plugged in, we're united, then the power flows. Then we are capacitated, enabled to love our neighbor. How come? Because we have the power to love our neighbor. Why? Because the one who is love itself has given himself to us. We have reciprocated. Love is repaid by love alone. That commerce of love results in an ability to love our neighbor. And so there's no such thing as loving your neighbor without first loving God. That's an, an, an illusion, a fantasy, and, and a total lack of understanding of spiritual things. I don't understand doing penances. Well, there was a great document by Pope Paul VI entitled Penitimini. That basically is the church's contemporary document on penance. The primary form of penance in the church is accepting joyfully the trials and tribulations which our state in life bring to us. That's, you know, moms... You know, hey, being a mom and a wife, accepting with joy the difficulties that your state in life entails. Dads, accepting, you know, the difficulty, going to work every day, supporting the family, you know, the, the, um, uh, the anxieties of daily life, bringing up your family in a tough world. By accepting joyfully the trials, tribulations, even the sufferings which your state in life bring, that's the primary form of penance. How do we do that? Quite simply, it's an act of the will. That's all. The will is very powerful. What happens? Well, I have to do that, right? I, I'm a priest. Maybe, maybe on a given day, I don't feel well. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm physically not feeling well. Well, you know, those things can be pen penances too. Uh, those sufferings, those sacrifices we offer, that, that's a form of penance too. Uh, well, on a given day, let's say um, yesterday, Friday, I, I would fast a little bit. Say, well, I want to offer this to the Lord. Uh, I want to do that little penance uh, and apply it to some, like today's program, to open somebody's heart or mind. Well, that's a form of penance. That's an example of doing that. Uh, you might not like cleaning toilets very much. It may not be your favorite thing to do at home. But... You merrily go about your job, toilet brush in hand, saying, good Lord, I hate this job, but I joyfully accept it, and I offer it up to you as a penance. It's not meaningless. That's not use useless. St. Teresa used to say, God moves about the pots and pans, and he really does. You know, in, in those little things, those annoying things, putting up with me can be a great penance for some of you. Oh, it can. It really can. But you say, well, all right. He means well, at least. And so let me put up with him. I only have three more days to go. I can probably stand that. But, well, I'm going to offer it up as a penance anyway, because it's not so easy. Wonderful. It might not be pleasant sometimes, you know. Sometimes to put up with your husband can be difficult. Okay. Offer those difficult times up. And there's power in it. Okay, could you please repeat what makes law authentic, then define what competent authority is? Okay, it's a good question. Authentic law 
is law which takes its origin from the divine law. Now remember that God is truth. God is the good. Anything that's true and good subsists in God, takes its origin from God. An example of something that isn't really authentic law, Wade versus Roe, and the law legalizing abortion. Is it law? Is it authentic law? No. No. Is that a real law? No, it isn't. Why? Because it doesn't have its origin in divine law. It is not part of the, ma the natural law, which manifests divine law. And so it's not authentic law. It's not in accord with reason. Let's face it. As I've said many times to people, and I have great sympathy for women who are suffering, they're scared, there are all kinds of reasons why they're afraid, maybe, to have the child. I sympathize with that. But I say, what do you think that is? Remember, law has to be in accord with right reason. What is that? And what are you doing to that? This thing now about partial birth abortion, an unbelievable, heinous abomination of a crime, that could be legal? That's when you know a country has totally lost its moral mind, when something like that is legal. That's the law of the land. Listen, don't be surprised at anything from now on. From now on, to murder the elderly or someone who doesn't have blonde hair, or blue eyes, oh, that's nothing. Because let me tell you something. If you can do partial birth abortions, you can do anything. You can repeat Dachau. You can repeat Auschwitz. You can repeat all the horrors and abominations of Nazi Germany, because if you can take a babe extracted from the mother's womb, and you know the rest of it, you can do anything. And when a country has elevated that outrage to the status of law, that country for sure has gone insane, has lost its moral sense, no longer knows what is good, what is evil, no longer knows the truth from a lie. And look out when that kind of thing becomes the law of the land. And so that's an example of something that's not real Law. That's why people who don't obey that law or resist that law aren't breaking the law, because that's not authentic law. We are supposed to love our enemies for the love of God, but we don't have to like them. Where do you draw the line? Well, remember, love is an act of the will, a decision, right? Someone could be driving me crazy, maybe. Now, I have to love them. Someone could have performed a partial birth abortion, or had one. Must I love them? Of course. I must love them. I must love them. I might not like very much what they did. I hate it. Yes. I don't have to maybe like their personality, but I have to decide to love them. An act of the will. What will I do if I love them? I will pray for them. I will serve them. I will do everything I can to help to show them Jesus Christ to bring them to conversion. And so, yes, there are times when we might not like certain persons, but we have to love them. The cardinals and bishops of the U.S. were united in urging Congress to override the presidential veto of the partial birth abortion ban act. Now that the vote is over and many Catholic senators, and I, yes, I just saw the list, many Catholic senators and House members did not vote in accordance with the teaching of the church. Catholic senators did not vote in accordance with that. What happens to those Catholic legislators? Well, let me tell you what I think should happen <laughs> to those Catholic legislators. We'll start there. And let me tell you what is an abomination if it doesn't happen. 
And let me tell you something that will weigh on the conscience, the heart of every bishop when he goes before God at the end of his life. If he doesn't do what God has probably already done, he's got to say, you're doing that, don't claim the name of Catholic, because you're not. They must be excommunicated. It is absolutely impossible, it is inconceivable, it is unjust, it is an outrage that any senator, that any member of the House who's Catholic or Christian can vote not to ban partial birth abortion. In other words, that's saying, let's do it, okay, fine. They must be excommunicated publicly. The scandal is public. The remedy must be public. And there's no other way. And the bishops have got to do that. The bishops have got to do that, not acting out of respect for man, but for God. And this is something that we may see. When we do see it, we may see some serious recriminations from the point of view of, of government. Well, you know, let it come. From the beginning, it was never easy to be Christian. It was never easy to follow Christ. It was never easy to spread out your arms and climb on a cross. But we know that the story doesn't end there. It goes towards resurrection.